Hi, good afternoon. My name is Julia Paget. I'm the branch manager at the Roswell Library. Today I'm going to be reading a little bit of Commonwealth by Ann Patchett. It's one of my favorite books. The introduction itself, the very first chapter, is almost a short story on its own. So I'm going to be reading a little bit from that today. And um, I will, there will definitely be some links so you can check out some more of Ann Patchett's works if you're not familiar with her. She's uh, really um, just a fantastic writer. So let's begin. The christening party took a turn when Albert Cousins arrived with Jen. Fix was smiling when he opened the door and he kept smiling as he struggled to make the connection. It was Albert Cousins from the district attorney's office standing on the cement slab of his front porch. He'd opened the door 20 times in the last half hour to neighbors and friends and people from church and Beverly's sister and all his brothers and their parents and practically an entire precinct worth of cops. But Cousins was the only surprise. Fix had asked his wife two weeks ago why she thought they had to invite every single person they knew in the world to a christening party, and she'd asked him if he wanted to look over the guest list and tell her who to cut. He hadn't looked at the list, but if she were standing at the door now, he would have pointed straight ahead and said, him. Not that he disliked Albert Cousins. He didn't know him other than to put his name together with his face. But not knowing him was the reason not to invite him. Fix had the thought that maybe Cousins had come to his house to talk him to him about a case. Nothing like that had ever happened before, but what else was the explanation? Guests were milling around in the front yard, and whether they were coming late or leaving early or just taking refuge outside because the house was packed beyond what any fire marshal would allow, Fix couldn't say. What he was sure of was that Cousins was there, uninvited, alone, with a bottle in a bag. Fix, Albert Cousins said. The tall deputy DA in a suit and tie put out his hand. Al, Fix said. Did people call him Al? Glad you made it. He gave his hand two hard pumps and let it go. I'm cutting it close, Cousins said, looking at the crowd inside as if there might not be room for him. The party was clearly past its midpoint. Most of the small, triangular sandwiches were gone, half the cookies. The tablecloth beneath the punch bowl was pink and damp. Fix stepped aside to let him in. You're here now, he said. Wouldn't have missed it, though of course he had missed it. He hadn't been at the christening. Dick Spencer was the only one from the DA's office Fix had invited. Dick had been a cop himself, had gone to law school at night, pulled himself up without ever making any of the other guys feel like he was better for it. It didn't matter if Dick was driving up black and white or standing in front of the judge, there was no doubt where he came from. Cousins, on the other hand, was a lawyer, like all the others, DAs, PDs, the hired guns, friendly enough when they needed something, but unlikely to invite an officer along for a drink. And if they did, it was only because they thought the cop was holding out on them. DAs were the guys who smoked your cigarettes because they were trying to quit. The cops who filled up the living room and dining room and spilled out into the backyard beneath the clothesline and the two orange trees, they weren't trying to quit. They drank iced tea mixed with lemonade and smoked like stevedores. Albert Cousins handed over the bag and Fix looked inside. It was a bottle of gin, a big one. Other people brought prayer cards or mother of pearl rosary beads or a pocket-sized Bible covered in a white kid with gilt-edged pages. Five of the guys, or their five wives, had kicked in together and bought a blue enameled cross on a chain, a tiny pearl at the center. Very pretty, something for the future. This makes a boy or a girl? Two girls, Cousin shrugged. What can you do? Not a thing, Fix said, and closed the door. Beverly had told him to leave it open so they could get some air, which went to show how much she knew about man's inhumanity to man. It didn't matter how many people were in the house, you didn't leave the door open. Beverly leaned out of the window. There were easily 30 people standing between them. The entire Meloy clan, all the Damadios, a handful of altar boys plowing through what was left of the cookies, but there was no missing Beverly, that yellow dress. 
Fix, she said, raising her voice over the den. It was Cousins who turned his head at first, and Cousins gave her a nod. By reflex, Fix stood straighter, but he let the moment pass. Make yourself at home, he said to the deputy district attorney and pointed out a cluster of detectives by the sliding glass door, their jackets still on. You know plenty of people here. Maybe that was true, maybe it wasn't. Cousins sure didn't know the host. Fix turned to cut his way through the crowd, and the crowd parted for him. Touching his shoulder and shaking his hand, saying congratulations, he tried not to step on any of the kids, his four-year-old daughter Carolyn among them, who were playing some sort of game on the dining room floor, crouching and crawling like tigers between the feet of adults. The kitchen was packed with wives, all of them laughing and talking too loud, none of them being helpful except for Lois from next door who was pulling bowls out of the refrigerator. Beverly's best friend, Wallace, was using the side of the bright chrome toaster to reapply her lipstick. Wallace was too thin and too tan, and when she straightened up, she was wearing too much lipstick. Beverly's mother was sitting at the breakfast table with the baby in her lap. They had changed her from lacy christening gown into a starched white dress with yellow flowers embroidered around the neck as if she were a bride who slipped in, into her going away dress at the end of the reception. The women in the kitchen took turns making a fuss over the baby, acting like it was their job to keep her entertained until the Magi arrived. But the baby wasn't entertained. Her blue eyes were glazed over. She was staring into the middle distance, tired of everything. All this rush to make sandwiches and take in presents for a girl who was not yet a year old. Look how pretty she is, his mother-in-law said to no one, running the back of one finger across the baby's rounded cheek. Ice, Beverly said to her husband. We're out of ice. That was your sister's assignment, Fix said. Then she failed. Can you ask one of the guys to go get some? It's too hot to have a party without ice. She had tied an apron behind her neck, but not around her waist. She was trying not to wrinkle her dress. Strands of yellow hair had come loose from her French twist and were falling into her eyes. If she didn't bring the ice, then she might at least come in here and make some sandwiches. Fix was looking right at Wallace when he said this, but Wallace capped her lis lipstick and ignored him. He had meant it to be helpful because clearly Beverly had her hands full. To look at her, to look at her anyone would think that Beverly was the sort of person who would have her parties catered someone who would sit on a couch while other people passed the trays. Bonnie's so happy to see all those cops in one room. She can't be expected to think about sandwiches, Beverly said. And then she stopped the assembling of cream cheese and cucumbers for a minute and looked down at his hand. What's in the bag? Fix held up the gin, and his wife, surprised, delivered the first smile he'd give, she'd given him all day, maybe all week. Whoever you send to the store, Wallace said, displaying a sudden interest in the conversation, tell them to get tonic. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And now Cousins has, is looking for the baby. The baby is somewhat missing. The crowd shifted around Cousins, opening to him, closing around him, pushing him through. In the dining room, every platter was stripped. Not a cracker or a carrot stick remained. The conversation and music and drunken laughter melted into a single, indecipherable block of sound from which the occasional clear word or sentence escaped. Turns out he's had her in the trunk the entire time he's talking. Somewhere, down a distant hallway, he couldn't see, a woman was laughing so hard she gasped for breath, calling, Stop! Stop! He saw children, plenty of children, several of whom were pulling cups straight from the unwinning fingers of adults and downing their contents. He didn't see any babies. The room was over warm and the detectives had their jackets off now, showing the service revolvers clipped their belts or holstered under their arms. Cousins wondered how he had failed to notice earlier that half the party was armed. He went through the open glass doors to the patio and looked up to the late afternoon sunlight that flooded the suburb of Downey, where there was not a cloud and never had been a cloud and never would be a cloud. He saw his friend the priest standing still as a stone, holding the little sister in his arms, 
as if they'd been dancing for so long they had fallen asleep standing up. Men sat in patio chairs, talking to other men, many of them with women in their laps. The women, all the ones he saw, had taken off their shoes at some point and ruined their stockings. None of them was holding a baby, and there was no baby in the driveway. Cousins stepped inside the garage and flipped on the light. A ladder hung on two hooks and clean cans of paint were lined up on a shelf according to size. There was a shovel, a rake, coils of extension cord, a bench of tools, a place for everything and everything in its place. In the center of the clean cement floor was a clean navy blue Peugeot. Fix Keating had fewer children, children and a nicer watch and a foreign car and a much better looking wife. The guy hadn't even made detective. If anyone had bothered to ask him at that moment, Cousins would have said it seemed suspicious. About the time he started really looking at the car, which seemed somehow sexy just by virtue of its being French, he remembered the baby was missing. He thought of his own baby, Jeanette, who had just learned to walk. Her forehead was bruised from where she had creamed into the glass yesterday, and the band-aids were still in place, and he panicked to think he was supposed to be watching her. Little Jeanette, he had no idea where he'd left her. Teresa should have known he wasn't any good at keeping up with the baby. She shouldn't have trusted him with this. But when he came out of the garage to try and find her, his heart punching in his ribs as if he wanted to go ahead of him, he saw all the people at Fix Keating's party. The proper order of the day was returned to him, and he stood for another moment, holding on to the door, feeling both ridiculous and relieved. He hadn't lost anything. When he looked back up at the sky, he saw the light was changing. He would tell Fix he needed to go home. He had his own kids to worry about. He went inside to find a bathroom and found two closets first. In the bathroom, he stopped to splash some water on his face before coming out again. On the other side of the hallway, there was yet another door. It wasn't a big house, but it seemed to be made entirely of doors. He opened the door in front of him and found the light inside was dim. The shadows were down. It was a room for little girls, a pink rug, a pink wallpaper border featuring fat rabbits. There was a room not unlike this in his own house that Holly shared with Jeanette. In the corner, he saw three small girls sleeping on a twin bed, their legs crossed over one another's legs, their fingers twisted in one another's hair. Somehow the only thing he failed to notice was Beverly Keating standing at the changing table with the baby. Beverly looked at him, a smile of recognition coming over her face. I know you, she said. She had startled him or her beauty startled him again. I'm sorry, he said. He put his hand on the door. You're not going to wake them up. She tilted her head towards the girls. I think they're drunk. I carried them in here one at a time and they never woke up. He went over and looked at the girls, the biggest one no more than five. He couldn't help but like the look of children when they were sleeping. Is this one, is one of them yours? He asked. The all three, three looked vaguely similar. None of them looked like Beverly Keating. Pink dress, she said, her attention on the diaper in her hand. The other two are her cousins. She smiled at him. Aren't you supposed to be fixing drinks? Spencer left, he said, but that didn't answer the question. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been nervous, not in, fa not in the face of criminals or juries, certainly not in the face of women holding diapers. He started again. Your husband asked me to find the baby. Finished with her work, Beverly rearranged the baby's dress and lifted her up from the table. Well, here she is. She touched her nose to the baby's nose, and the baby smiled and yawned. Somebody's been awake a long time. Beverly turned towards the crib. Let me take her out to fix for a minute before you put her down. Beverly Keating tilted her head slightly to one side and gave him a funny look. Why does fix need her? It was everything, the pale pink of her mouth in the darkened pink room, the door that was closed now, though he didn't remember closing it, the smell of her perfume, which had somehow managed to float gently above the familiar stench of the diaper pail. Had Fix asked him to bring the baby back or just to find her? It didn't make any difference. He told her he didn't know, and then he stepped towards her, her yellow dress and its, its own source of light. He held out his arms, and she stepped into them, holding out the baby. I'm going to end it there because I don't want you to know what happens next. Um, however, please 
um, pick up a copy of Commonwealth or you can download it. I believe it's available in one of uh, either through Hoopla or Libby. It's a really fantastic read. It spans the next chapter um, that you come to after this first chapter is it actually takes place several years in the future so then it's you have these um, young children are now all adults. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant book so I highly recommend it. I hope you've enjoyed today's book break. Please make sure that you are um, continuing to read. You can still down, um, you can still uh, log your books through our story reading for the fall program through Beanstack, which you should all be familiar with from summer reading. And I hope you've enjoyed today. Thank you for listening. Bye.